Hi, I'm Tyra G., your host for Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Welcome again to our virtual global gathering of phenomenal women and those who love you. Yes, you, mothers, daughters, grand and great-grandmothers, fearsome and generous, humble and honest, and in pursuit of new possibilities and purpose. For those of you joining us for the very first time, each month we will explore a new theme inspired by you. Yes, I said you. Together we'll bravely walk into places where tradition has taught us that there are some things we just don't talk about, but not at this table. No matter how hard judgment knocks, it can't come in. Beloved ladies here, we live beyond the wreckage. Every week, we will meet here for one hour to experience, encourage, and empower each other. We're going to share some aha moments and stories that have been left in our pockets for too long. Every week, we'll start where we are. Although many of your voices will speak light into darkness, there is no insignificant person around this table. Each show will have three segments. The first segment is uniquely called The Beginning, where I will walk you in and set the stage for the day. The middle is our show's sister talk. It's a centerpiece where one phenomenal woman or man, generous and fearless, will join me in the interview seat. I named the last segment, It's Not Over. That's where I'll deposit thoughts of empowerment and encouragement for you to take with. Think of it as a spiritual doggy bag just in case your soul needs a snack while we're apart. You're listening to Radio Fairfax, Fairfax, Virginia, on your TV, computer, or mobile device. And we are webcast worldwide on the Internet at www.radiofairfax.org every Saturday evening at 8 p.m. Should you miss us? No worry. You can catch our podcast on YouTube, Frankly Speaking with Tyra G., And if you just feel like connecting with me offline, you know I love that, and it is easy. Just email me at tyra at tyragarlington.com. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thank you, Courtney Nero, for composing and performing our Frankly Speaking theme song, and for naming it, I'm Listening. I am so excited about how the show is progressing. We're celebrating the sixth month of Proust, proof that dreams can come true. Frankly speaking with Tyra G is one of my most special dreams. I thank God for remembrance, every remembrance of you and your gifts of ideas, your presence, your encouragement. They've been the gifts that inspired me to keep on keeping on. I can't do this show without you, but you know that, don't you? I like to begin each show by creating a mood and giving us a virtual common space to inhabit while we're together. This month, we're celebrating Women's History Month, womanhood, us. Yes, our theme is the wonder of women. Wow. It it happens 250 times a minute, about 15,000 times every hour. It happens after years of effort and anticipation or by accident. It occurs on every socioeconomic level in every country and village in the world. But no matter how frequently it transpires, no matter how commonplace an event is, we always stand back in awe and say, a miracle that one being should give birth to, should create another. If there is any area in which a create in which a creature em, emulates its creator, if there is any act by which we express the spark of divinity at our core, it is the miracle of birth. Yet, it is in this the godliest of our achievements. The we also most reveal the limitations of our individuality. Think about this: feeding, sleeping, thinking producing a work of art, or building a house. Virtually everything we do, we can do on our own. But giving birth to a child is something we can do only together with another person. To give birth, we must cease to be an entity unto ourselves and become a part, a component of a community of two. 
Because if we are only what we are, we are most decidedly not divine. As beings unto ourselves, we are finite and self-absorbed things. We're manufacturers rather than creators. To create, we must rise above our individuality. To actualize our divine essence, we must transcend the bounds of self. It is the woman, not the man, who gives birth. It is the woman who is most fulfilled in parenthood and who most acutely feels the lack when parenthood is denied her. It is the woman who continues to mother her child long after the man has fathered it. Because it is the woman who most surrenders her selfhood to create life. She is passive and receptive in the pre -pro procreation process. For nine months, her body ceases to be hers alone, and it bears and, and nurtures another life. So it is the woman rather than the man who conceives and gives birth, and to whom motherhood is a state of being rather than an achievement or experience. Yet everyone can become a, quote, mother. What comes naturally to the female half of creation can be learned and assimilated by all. And not only in giving birth to children, but in everyone's life's endeavors. We all have the power to recognize that there is more to our existence than the narrow confines of individual identity. We have the power to become more than we are and to do more than we can by becoming receptive to the divine essence that underlies the self and pervades the whole existence. The legacy of womanhood is an interconnection across time with a need for those who have come before and a responsibility to those who will come afterward. Let me say a woman's legacy may take many forms. Children, grandchildren, a business, an ideal, a book, a community, a home, some piece of ourselves. How many of us are living our lives so that our legacy reflects all that we truly hold most dear? How many of us are living with integrity and courage? The world isn't connected by molecules. It's connected by stories, trend, traditions, memories, hopes, and dreams. We are connected by the legacies passed down from those who came before and the legacies we pass down to those who come after us. After our break, we're going to meet three phenomenal women of wonder who have been and are testimonies that legacy is very much about life and living. One through her written story, another in our live interview today, and lastly, another through an example of her poetry. But first, a commercial break. Don't go far. And we are back. I want to ask you a question. How many people does it take to change the world? And the answer is one. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how much time you have or how much time you have left. You know, you're never too old or too sick or too broke or too broken to be of use to God. It's been said that man's finish is God's beginning. Regina Brett shared this story in her 2012 book entitled Be the Miracle. And I quote her words. I met Ella Mae Cheeks Johnson when she was 101. She had traveled to 30 countries and outlived two husbands. Ella Mae dug through a stack of papers and pulled out the speech she wrote when she turned 90. Nope, not that one. She grabbed the speech she wrote when she was 95. Nope, wrong again. She pulled out a speech she gave when she turned 100. Her black wheelchair barely contained her energy. She scooted her feet across the floor to navigate it to the bookshelves. She had just finished reading Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I met her in 2005, shortly after she received the Distinguished Alumni Award from the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western University. At that time, she was the oldest living graduate of the program. When a dean went to visit her, she was reading the 9-11 Commission Report. I wanted to know what they found out, she said. 
At her 100th birthday party, she printed a list of her favorite books and passed it out to, to her guests. A picture of the Good Samaritan she painted 81 years earlier sat on her dresser. It's the Bible study story about a man who stopped to help a beaten stranger others had ignored. The story had shaped her whole life. She knew about Good Samaritans because at four years old, she was adopted by two after she had lost both her parents. That painting was the last thing she saw at night and the first thing she saw when she woke up. It was a challenge to Ella Mae Johnson and her life, and it was her version of Yes, We Can. When she turned 105, she traveled to Washington, D.C., to see the inauguration of the first black president. Ella Mae died in 2010. Extraordinary life, excuse me, right before her memoir, It Is Well With My Soul, The Extraordinary Life of a 106-Year-Old Woman was published. Ella Mae was brave and deliberate. She did not lament the times that prevented her from teaching French as an African-American woman. Instead, she became a renowned social worker. Ella Mae stopped asking herself what she wanted, what she desired, what interested her. Instead, she asked, what had to be given back? And then she gave it for 105 years. A lifelong learner, she figured out her why along the way as her passions became acquainted with her gifts. And she walked into her destiny. My second guest and phenomenal woman, or woman of wonder, or wow woman, I met recently at a conference. I was blown away. She is grace personified. She is also the oldest living competitive bodybuilder. Her record lives in the Guinness Book of World Records. I will in- introduce to some and present to others Ms. Mrs. actually, Ernestine Shepherd. And Ernie, thank you for doing this, for being here and sharing with my listening audience. And I thought it would be more fun if you, in your own words, let them know who you are. So why don't you tell us a bit about you? First of all, I'd like to say I am so happy to be able to talk on the radio about the things that I have done. My name is Ernestine Shepherd. I am 81 years of age, and I am the oldest female competitive bodybuilder in the world. And what a thrill that is and has been for me. Well, there had to be a process. You didn't just suddenly become a <laughs> bodybuilder. Now, come on. I know you're good. But you just didn't wiggle your nose, and here you were. What what <laughs> what what led up to that? What I mean, you had to work at it, didn't you? I certainly did. The story goes this way: At one time, my sister and I, and her name was Velvet. She was fifty-seven years of age, and I was fifty-six. My husband had invited us to a church picnic. Mm -hmm. And he said, you ladies can wear a bathing suit because they'll have a pool there and you can just have some fun. Mm -hmm. We hadn't been in a bathing suit in years. (laughs) I can relate to that part. (laughs) (laughs) So we went to purchase these suits. Velvet had the audacity to turn around and look at me and start laughing. And I, in turn, looked at her and I said, well, you can laugh at me if you want, (laughs) but you aren't looking so good yourself. (laughs) Velvet said, let's take these suits off. Let's leave them here. We can't go looking this way. So we left the suits at the store, Mm -hmm. went to the picnic, and we were sitting by the pool, and we heard ladies mentioning that they were going someplace to exercise. Mm Mm-hmm. So we listened and listened. Finally, within a week's time, we decided to go where these ladies said they were exercising. Mm -hmm. And we did. It was called Coppin College at that time. 
we went there and we started doing aerobics. Then uh, from aerobics, we started lifting weights. However, Belle was just really doing everything right. The girlfriend here wasn't doing anything <laughs> right, so <laughs> you didn't see much of a change in my body. Uh-huh. Do you know I had the audacity to get angry with her because she was on television in the newspapers telling people how to exercise. Your so your sister day, your sister got a program? She was on she was no, she didn't have a program. Oh. She was invited to various programs. Okay, okay. To speak. Mm-hmm. So I got angry, left the gym this particular night and vowed that I'd never go back. Bella was such a sweet person. She came to the house and she said, if you want this joy I'm having, you better get busy. Mm. So I started working out with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. And I saw the change in my body. I, too, had begun using weights. Mm -hmm. And, oh, boy, it was so much fun. (laughs) So finally, Bella said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to try to motivate and and inspire other seniors the importance of living a healthy, happy, positive lifestyle by exercising, eating correctly, getting out, doing some type of cardio, which would be walking. Mm -hmm. And then she said, and the next thing, prayer plays an important part in everything that you do. Mm. Well, I said to her, we were doing all right until you mentioned prayer. Why do we have to bring prayer into this? Mm -hmm. She said, because, as I mentioned, prayer is very, very important. So to keep her quiet, I said, okay. (laughs) So, because I really didn't believe in that at that moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, we went on, and boy, we did inspire many people to get out and start exercising. But one day, Velva came to me and she said, if anything were to happen to me, Mm -hmm. do you think you could keep this up? And I looked at her and I said, vice versa, if something would happen to me, could you keep it up? Mm -hmm. She says, I'm not playing. Listen to what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I listened again. And I said, well, okay, if you say so, I will do it. Little did I know that she was sick. But then she came to me several times telling me various things that were happening to her. Mm -hmm. One thing she mentioned, she said that her head hurt her so badly. Mm -hmm. And I was under the impression that it was due to the fact that she wore hair in a ponytail and had it too tight because I wear mine that way. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, maybe you need to loosen it up. Then the next time she said she couldn't see good out of one eye. The next time she said it felt like water was running in her ear. And then the last time she mentioned, she said, my goodness, I got up this morning and I didn't know who I was, but I got myself together. So I said, this is enough. I'm coming to you and we're going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. However, my parents and my younger sister had gotten there ahead of me and they took her to the hospital. When they took her to the hospital, gosh, they were waiting so long that I arrived and she was still sitting in the waiting room. Oh, wow. So I suggested, let's leave and go to another hospital. Mm -hmm. So we did. I sat in the back seat of the car and she laid her head on my lap. And my parents and baby sister were in the front seat. Velvet looked up at me. She raised her head off my lap, and she said, Remember what I told you. Mm. Please remember what I told you. I said, If anything happens to me, would you continue? And you said yes. 
She says, hold up your pinky finger. That's the way we seal things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I held up my pinky finger to her, and we put them together. Well, we got to the hospital. Mm -hmm. She walked in and told them what was going on, and they took her immediately. Mm -hmm. They examined her. And little did I know, I thought maybe we would sit there for a while and then we'd go back home. Mm -hmm. But the doctors came in the waiting room and said, your sister and to my parents, your daughter, had a brain aneurysm. Oh. And it had already burst. And all the symptoms that she had mentioned to you, mm -hmm. They were the symptoms of the aneurysm. And by her exercise in the way that she did, she stayed on her feet longer than the average woman. Wow. You just so, said a lot right there. You just said a lot. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Isn't that something? That's amazing. I'm oh. telling you. Oh, my gosh. So we knew and Velvet knew that if she were to go on life support, mm -hmm. she wouldn't be much good. Mm -hmm. So she died right then and there. And when she died, I ran around that hospital and I said, now I don't have anyone. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. My baby sister hugged me and she said, you have me. I loved her dearly, but that wasn't what I wanted at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I just stood there. But then she wanted to have a memorial service. That's what she always told her. Mm -hmm. And we had a memorial service for her. And I loved to sing. And I managed. I managed to get up at that service and sing the Lord's Prayer by Gates. Hmm. And after I had sung that and the service was over, I was the meanest, ugliest person that you would ever want to meet. And as I mentioned to you earlier, as my sister Velvet mentioned about prayer, mm -hmm. I really wasn't much into prayer because I was a person that walked around. I thought it was cute to say bad words. Mm. And, oh, I would say bad words, and Bill would say to me, one day something's going to change you, and I hope I'll be around to see it. I said, I don't need to change because I'm happy the way that I am. Mm. But getting back to what I was saying, I ended up with high blood pressure, panic attacks, acid reflux. Gosh, I was on all kinds of medications. Mm -hmm. They knew me at ER because I was constantly there because I was sick all the time. Mm. And I didn't do anything that I promised them that I would do. But one night, I had gone to bed. Mm -hmm. And I want you to listen to this. She came to me in a dream. Mm. And she said, you are not doing what I asked you to do. Get up and do what I asked you to do. Tyra, I looked around. I didn't see anyone. Mm -hmm. And I said, she couldn't have been. But then I said, it had to have been her. I didn't move right away. Mm -hmm. I decided within about a week's time or two weeks, and I decided to go to a church, not to my church. I went to another church, mm -hmm. and I sat on the very back pew in that church. And let me tell you this. Years ago, when I would go to church, and I would see people jumping up, making noise and whatever, and I would say to Velvet, there they go again, playing church. They know they don't feel anything. And I would sit there and laugh. I told you I was bad. And I went to this church. This organist started playing this particular song. Mm -hmm. And the words were, Here I am, Lord. It 
is I, Lord. Mm -hmm. I have heard you calling through the night. I will go, Lord, where you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. Mm. Tyra, this never happened to me. Mm -hmm. I jumped up. I disrupted that service. And I said, restore to me Mm. the joy of my salvation. Wow. Restore to me the joy of each new day. Give me back the love that I once had for you. Mm. And never, ever let me slip away. I was 58 years of age. That's when I found God. Mm. That's when I knew what it was like Mm -hmm. to love the Lord. That was when I knew that I would be a better person. And I knew right then and there I would follow what she wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. Well, I was working out with a friend. His name was Raymond Day. At age 58, we worked out, we worked out. And Velvet had always always said that she wanted to be in the Guinness Book of World Records. And that we would go in there together Uh as two of the oldest sisters in fitness. And she wanted us to be in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Raymond Day knew all of this because he knew Velvet. And he kept saying to me, when are you going to try to be a bodybuilder and do the things that Velvet wanted? Mm -hmm. He said, I've taken you as far as I can. He had me in Essence Magazine. He had me on The View. So many shows he had me on. But he knew he couldn't do the thing of the bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. So at age 71, I contacted the former Mr. Universe, Yanni Schamberger, mm-hmm. and I told him my dream. He called me Ernie. He said, Ernie, if you will work, you can make your dream come true. Mm-hmm. I can take you on a long journey, but you're going to have to do everything that I tell you. Mm-hmm. Do you think you could do this? And I looked at him and I smiled and I said, yes. Well, we worked out for seven months. I was 71, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Then he said, you're ready for your first show. I did my very first bodybuilding show. Mm -hmm. Tara, I came in first place. Oh, my gosh, at 71. At 71. Praise the Lord. And Yanni called me after the show, I guess about two or three weeks later. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what? I got a call from the Guinness Book of World Records, and they say that they think you are the oldest female competitive bodybuilder in the world. But they have to check it out. Mm -hmm. He said, we have to hold on Mm -hmm. and see if it's true. Well... Within a matter of two or three weeks, we heard from them again. And they said that I was. And they wanted Yanni and me to come to Rome so that I could get my certificate Mm -hmm. and my medal. Mm -hmm. Don't you know? We traveled to Rome March the 16th. That was my sister Velvet's birthday. Oh, my goodness. When we arrived in Rome, when we got off the plane, there was a car waiting for us. Mm -hmm. And the tag number on that car was 316. She was with you. And when we got to the hotel, Mm -hmm. Velvet's favorite song was playing. Mm. When you walk. Mm Mm-hmm. Through a storm, hold, you. hold your head up high. Mm-hmm. You know it. I know you it. You never walk alone. Yeah. And I stood there, and the tears got in my eyes. And I said, oh, my goodness. Velvet is here with me. Mm-hmm. She is here, and 
I didn't let Yanni know that I had carried some of her ashes with me. Oh. And at a quiet moment, I went outside and I scattered her ashes as far as I could. And I was very, very happy because I could have done that. So her ashes, so her ashes are there somewhere in Rome, even though they're blown away, whatever. <laughs> but I got them there. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And then, Tyra, I got my medal, mm-hmm. my certificate. Mm-hmm. I came home. Don't you know the next thing I knew? I got a call from New York. Mm -hmm. Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yes. I ended up in that magazine as Granny's six-pack. That was a dream that she wanted. All the shows she said that we would appear on. I have done that. Mm. But it's only because of the good Lord that all of this has happened for me. I'm so grateful. I'm mighty grateful. And I tell people, no matter where I go and whenever I speak, I tell them that I truly love the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because without him, wouldn't any of these wonderful things happen for me? And nobody but the good Lord has kept me on my feet but him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one but him. And Velvet and I used to do a lot of walking. And don't you know, at age 71, I stopped walking and I had begun running. Oh, my. And I've done nine or ten marathons. And each one that I have done, I've come in first place in my age category. I've done half marathons. The same thing happened. 10Ks, 5Ks, I come in first place in my age category. Nobody but the good Lord is doing this for me. Nobody but him. And then it's just that Velvet had set that goal, and I was able to fulfill it. I am so happy that I could do it. I thank her every day. I pray every day and thank the Lord for giving me such a beautiful sister. I I, I, I know the audience, like me, is feeling her beauty and her closeness. Uh, yes. Perhaps she was your angel. And oh, no. um, the thing that I think is special, as I listen, Ernie, you said you were bad. I don't believe that because oh, God yes, created you. Your behavior was one that, <laughs> you know. You you were you were being uh, you were in process. How's that? You were in process. Okay, I like that. <laughs> you were in process of becoming who God created you to be, but you just took your you know you have the choices. Something He gave us, right? So you That's just right. made some choices that you went you know over here for a while and over there for a while and <laughs> you know and over there for a while and yes, then yes. then you went to church and played church like all them people that you had talked about. <laughs> But see, that's the nice thing about God. I think he has a great sense of humor, right? Oh, my goodness. Because he has already finished your life and my life, you know. He's just waiting for us to get on course, right? (laughs) And you have done it so beautifully. The the thing, I don't know if you, you, well, yeah. I want to know, what do you do every day? Because we've talked on the phone. You said, well, I go to the gym here and I go to the gym there. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, okay. What do you do every day, uh, one of those days? What's it like? What, when does your day start? My day starts about 2.30 every morning. 2.30 a.m. Uh-huh. A.m. I'm up at 2.30. I have my devotions. Mm-hmm. I will meditate. Then I will eat. Mm-hmm. And then after I eat, then I'll put my clothes on. And I leave the house about I'll say about quarter of four in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I go to the park. I'm not alone. And I do my running. Oh, my. I come back in and I eat again, Mm -hmm. redress, and I'm at the gym by 7 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And at 7.30, 
I start my training. And with my training, I'm training other ladies as I'm training. Oh. We train, yes, we train until about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Okay. And the reason why it's so long is because I have at least eight women, and we, we're working out, but a normal workout is really no more than an hour. But mm-hmm. I have so many people working with me, that's why it takes that long. Mama. Then after I do that, then I have a 9.30 class. And that class consists of approximately 40 to 45 people. And we do total body sculpt. And we do glutes. Mm. Of course, we do abs. That class lasts from 9.30 until 11. Oh, my. And then I come back home. That's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's my schedule then. On Thursdays, I train people at 5.30 at the gym until 7. Then I go to a resource center on Tuesday and Thursday morning, and I train people there. And it's a blessing because I love what I do. And people will tell you, anyone that I meet, because Velvet told me that when you are out and you meet people, mm-hmm. make certain that you give them a hug. Mm-hmm. But you don't know who needs a hug. That's right. I and said then it, sometimes, yes. That's true. And then not only with them needing a hug, I need one too. I know that's right. I know that's right. So that's and what I do. There, there is, it's interesting because I used to do uh, the welcome at church, and I would say, you know, I want everybody to give someone a hallelujah hug because you don't know right. who needs it. And for me, I'm singular, and at church was the only time I was feeling any contact. And you know, human touch, the power of touch is essential. Ooh. It's it can heal. I have gone to nursing homes and you know into memory uh, care units, and mm-hmm. people are not responsive. And I have just rubbed on their arm and whispered. And there would, you know, an eye would open or they would look up, yes, yes. you know, and I said, uh, that is just so essential. And we, I don't know whether we're getting away. I don't know what's happening to us right now, I but know. I know the need hasn't gone away. We need each other. We need yes. this. And what I love about your story, it reminds me that broken vessels Full of God's grace can do anything. Oh, oh my God. And you know, you, Ernie, we got to, I know you're on TV and I know people have seen you and I have seen you and I got my hug from Ernie, everybody. I got a couple of three <laughs> of them. I loaded up on them. Yes, I did. I knew this was somebody. And oh, by the way, I met her when there were about 300 other women there, okay, including. Uh, Gen X, millennials, people like me that are into the toilet paper roll. And Ernie came to this function, and she had on her uh, workout attire and proceeded <laughs> to take off her top. And people are going, really? Come on now. 81 year what? And we're sitting there going, okay, all right, mm-hmm, all right. <laughs> but the thing I think, Ernie, is important for people to understand is that you made up your mind to do this. You kept the promise. Yes. And number two, it's hard work. It is not a walk in the park. And you committed and you did it and you got the reward. And, oh, my God, I am so proud of you. Thank you so much. What do you eat? (laughs) What do you eat, (laughs) Annie? First of all, I drink a lot of liquid egg whites. I have a sponsor, and uh, they send them to me through the mail. And I drink at least. Three to four glasses of liquid egg whites every day. So that's your big protein. I, that's my protein. Mm-hmm. I eat chicken, mm-hmm. tuna fish, and turkey. Mm-hmm. Baked white potatoes, baked sweet potatoes, brown rice. Mm-hmm. Again, my vegetables have no preservatives in them at all. Okay. Uh, spinach, gosh, corn. Carrots, 
oh, you name it, I eat them. I eat a cup full with each meal. Mm, I'm really writing this do. down now. Cup full with each meal. <laughs> and I drink a lot of water. Right. Now, I don't take any type of supplement. Okay. Everything that I do is natural. Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I just want others to know to do what you can, but try to do it as natural as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And if people were to see me, no, I do not have big muscles. I'm just toned. And that lets others know that they too can achieve the same thing by eating healthy and getting out doing your cardio. And oh, by the way, she is toned. She is definitely toned. <laughs> and I have, um, I've had some medical issues, but when I moved to California to go to graduate school, I looked around those people, Ernie, I said, I wonder what they eat, because they sure do look well. <laughs> and I, you know, I started walking then. That was the first thing. I walk, walk, walk. And then I gave up meats. I eat fish and fowl. Yeah. And, okay. you know, baked and boiled, that kind of mm-hmm. thing. And mm-hmm. and I love raw vegetables. But oh. um, I did not know, and this is this is new to me, and I'm going to share it with people. I, I had surgery, a blessed surgery, uh, actually saved my life last May. And a friend of mine has a health food store, and he sent me a box full of things, you know, that, mm-hmm. that would uh, enhance bone growth, that would do this, yes, that, and yes, the other. Yes. So I'm reading all of this, and I'm realizing that, I don't get enough protein. So Mm -hmm, since mm -hmm. November, every day I use uh, protein whey. Uh, I I try to get at least 60 grams of protein through a protein shake plus the whey plus, uh, you know. But no, or, you know, I don't look like you, okay, because I'm walking. I got my Fitbit on, and I'm doing, and I just got introduced to weights after my heart attack. I had no idea. Oh you can shape God. your body with weights. It's yes. amazing. And it's not, yes. you don't have to be lifting 50 pounds. No. All you need is resistance, you know. That's all you need. And mm-hmm. I was just fascinated. And so if y'all women out there, listen up. You can be cute if you want to. It's a decision now. <laughs> it is up to you. Um, Ernie, do you by any chance have handy a letter from Velvet? Do you have it with you? Yes, I do. Yay! You guys have to hear this because on my show, I always ask uh, my guest to write a letter to their younger self and to read it. And I heard Ernie read a letter from her sister, and you all have heard now how close they are. They had a head-to-head, heart-to-heart, and spirit-to-spirit. Well, let me put, not had, not in the past, they have. For forever they are. And so Ernie said, you know, I think I'd like to read my letter from Velvet. And so I'm, I'm kind of wondering, would you like to share that with us now? I certainly would. I'll have to tell you, Velvet uh, didn't actually write this. It was written by Christian D. Lawson. Oh, okay. And she she gave this to me, and she says, I want you every day to read this and let follow just what Christian D. Lawson said. Okay. Well, you know, when I saw that, I said, I can't do that at that time. Oh, that's, said, you, that's you in your developmental stage still, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. But I have followed this. All of these years now, and let me share what she gave me. I'm ready. It goes this way. I promise myself to be strong, that nothing can disturb my peace of mind, to talk health, happiness, and prosperity to every person I meet. Mm. To make all my friends feel that there is something worthwhile in them. Mm. To look at the sunny side of everything and make my optimism come true. To think only of the best. To work only for the best. Mm. And to expect only the best. To be just as enthusiastic about the success of others 
as I am about my own. Uh huh. To forget the mistakes of the past and press on to the greater achievements of the future. Mm -hmm. To wear a cheerful expression at all times. Yes. And give a smile to every living creature I meet. To give so much time to improving myself that I have no time to criticize others. Mm. To be too large for worry. Too noble for anger, too strong for fear, mm. and too happy to permit the presence of trouble. Mm -hmm. To think well of myself and proclaim this fact to the world, not in loud words, but in great deeds. Mm. To live in the faith that the whole world is on my side. So long as I am true to the best that is in me, I try to live that way every day of my life. Well, it sounds to me you. you, you, oh, well, I said in the beginning, you amaze me. You mm -hmm. are grace personified. I am humbled, just rubbing, a, rubbing up against your spirit. It just keeps me going. And I wanted to share your story. I wanted to have it on record so I can keep it. And, oh, by the way, ladies and gents who are listening, uh, if you don't catch our story live, um, we post our uh, show on YouTube at Frankly Speaking with Tyra G. Forever. I don't know what forever is anymore, but I'll be, <laughs> it'll be up there for a long time. And please, everybody, give a shout-out of praise in your heart. For Mrs. Ernie Shepherd, who has kept her sister Velvet alive in everything that she does. And uh, what else can I say? I'm just, whoo, I'm happy. And I, I know I got I to gotta get ready to get out of here. Um, <laughs> I need to, I did want to talk about the third woman that um, I met some years ago. And um, she, she, mm, she, she made my... Well, she left her tattoo on my spirit, actually. I mm -hmm. met her. She was a guest speaker. She came to Cincinnati, Ohio. We cooked gumbo with a group of people. Mm. And she said, the best gift you can give anyone is to remember their name. Now, that's in the oh. 70s. Now, imagine this. In 2007, I saw her again to have a conversation. She remembered. Get this. She remembered the name of the president of the group, and it was Maya Angelou. And I want to I want to sing her praises through a poem that she wrote and is in her book. And still I rise. She wrote this in 1978, and I I hold on to it because she didn't always feel the way she felt in this poem. She is like Ernie, a a process. She went through things to get to where she was. So if I may take the next couple of moments and read for you, mm. Phenomenal Woman. Mm. Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size, but when I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my steps, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman. Phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. I walk into a room just as cool as you please. And to a man, the fellows stand or fall down on their knees. They swarm around me like a hive of honeybees. I say it's in the fire of my eyes and the flash of my teeth, the swing of my waist and the joy in my feet. I'm a woman. Phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. Men themselves have wondered what they see in me. They try so much, but they can't touch my inner mystery. When I try to show them, they say they still can't see. I say it's in the arch of my back and the sun of my smile, the ride of my breast, the grace of my style. I'm a woman, phenomenally. Phenomenal woman, that's me. 
Now, you understand why my head's not bowed. I don't shout or jump about or have to talk real loud. When you see me passing, it ought to make you proud. I say, it's in the click of my heels, the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, and the need for my care. Because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman. That's me. Maya was also considered to be one of the most consequential women of the 20th century. Mm. She had such a diverse career. It spanned 50, excuse me, five decades. She was a singer, a dancer, a journalist, and a civil rights activist. Later, she was award-winning, a, an award-winning author, a poet, and a screenwriter. Mm. Now, all of you women of wonder out there at the table, and all of you who love them, you have had an opportunity to be both empowered and encouraged by three legacies of womanhood. Women of wonder. Wow. You need to know, all of you need to know, all of you need to hear this and know this, that you have all you need to be who you were created to be and to thrive within you. Your job is to say yes to that power. You are worthy you're not alone. Nothing that has happened to you will be wasted. I want you to refuse to be refused. Your voice will save you. I am here, and I am listening. I promise. I so look forward to our time together every week, and next week is no exception. Your seat at the table is guaranteed. All you have to do is show up. For the last minute, let's have our Mr. Tony Walker take us out on the piano version of our theme song. Take care now. Bye-bye.